it's not subtle. It's not subtle at all. One of the most difficult challenges that we face as recording engineers, mix engineers, producers, composers, whatever it is you call yourself, is taking the music that you spend so much time crafting in your studio, in your room, and making that music translate and sound good in other people's headphones, in other people's studios, in their cars, in their AirPods. I've spent enough time researching acoustics that I think it might be impossible to get a perfectly flat, even space, but we can do some things. I've spent a lot of money and a lot of time in this room, even though it's a very, very small space, and the physics of sound make it difficult for me to get anywhere close to a flat signal. So that is where software correction comes into play. There's a good chance that you have used or heard of Sonarworks. I've used it for years, and today I wanna to talk about their new version. They've rebranded what was once called Reference 3 and 4, or is now called Sound ID. They didn't give me the software, they didn't tell me what to say. All I did was email them and ask if I could have an affiliate link, which you can do too, if you're a YouTuber or an influencer like myself. So use my link in the description, I get a kickback. In their promotional material, Sonarworks talks about removing coloration from your headphones and from the speakers, and more importantly, the speakers in the room. Again, my acoustic knowledge is minimal at best, but I think there's a consensus that really small rooms, which this is, although my room looks kind of big, every time somebody comes over here who's watched my videos, they think, wow, your room is much smaller. So it's only nine and a half feet wide, and it's 20 feet deep, and it's anywhere from 10 to 12 feet tall. I can still do more to even out the low frequency response, and because of a great website by a guy named Jesco, hopefully I can get Jesco to watch this, and I could get him on my channel. Uh, he's taught me so much about especially low-end acoustics. As far as reflections in my reflection zone, I think I'm doing okay for where I am, but always room for improvement. The difficulty in making this video is that you're gonna have to trust what I have to say about this because it's the way the music sounds in my room. And unless you're here, you won't be able to tell. You can download the free trial, which is what I have done up to this point. Now, if you don't have the proper microphone, then your results won't be accurate. I'm actually not using the mic that they sell and recommend. I'm using this DBX measurement microphone, which I believe is accurate, but if I'm wrong, let me know in the comments. Let's jump into the software. I want to quickly show you how the measurement process works. Sound ID reference comes in two parts. There's the global part of the plugin that basically goes on your system audio. Now, when I open up Pro Tools, I have to put it as an insert on my master channel as the last insert. I'll show you that later on. I do have one issue with the plugin inside the DAW. If you export, with the room correction on, you forget to bypass or inactivate that plugin, well then it prints any of the correction that you have inside the plugin. That can be devastating when you're mixing or mastering and your final output is just a little off and it's not obvious sometimes, it could slip past you. But this is the system audio version and I've already got my profile loaded in, but I'm gonna make a new one. So I'm gonna go down here to create a new speaker profile. I have no idea how this process works, but it's a lot of fun. And it takes a while, but that's good because it's thorough. Keep it at ear level, aim between the speakers, and hold the microphone away from your body so you don't get the reflections. Here we go. Okay, determine the distance. This is the, this is the crazy part. Stay where you are. Measurements in progress. <laughs> Left speaker done. <laughs> It's saying that my speakers are four feet, five inches apart from one another. Now we're gonna locate my listening spot, which again is about right here-ish. Done. Let's see how close I was to the triangle. Three foot, six inches. And I think I was a little too far forward. I think normally I'm right about something like this. Four foot. I may have redone that test just to make myself feel better. I don't know. 37 points. This is what takes a long time. This is really cool. It gets feedback from the sound and tells me where to move throughout the room. Here we go. That is what my room looks like, and that is not good. In the past, I showed this curve to someone, and they seem to think that maybe there's something wrong you know, electronically in my room and in my signal path, not just through the acoustics. And that could very well be true. But for our purposes, it doesn't matter. If it corrects it and it makes it sound better, then it is worth it. But you can see a significant drop under 100 hertz and then a big 6 dB boost 
uh, in the lower mids to mids and then it it drops so that's uh, kind of funky if that's what my room really sounds like then I've got to have software like this. This seems like a good time to pause and talk about kind of my whole attitude toward this process. When I first got into studying about room acoustics, it was everything had to be perfect in my room. The setup had to be as perfect and I had to be in the right spot. There couldn't be any weird reflections. And I made a lot of choices on the furniture, all based on that. But when I became a kind of all-in-one composer producer I decided that I wanted to have a room that functioned the way that I wanted that also sounded good and I rely heavily on my headphones I use the Sennheiser HD 600s I trust them I know they're not perfect I know a lot of people say don't do your critical listening on headphones but I do and every piece of music well that's the last stop is those headphones it's far more important to me that I can function the way that I want to function. And I want good sound along the way, but the things that are on my desk, including this giant light, well, I make YouTube videos, so that light's gotta be here. So I might as well run the correction with everything the way that my room needs to be set up for me to get the job done. I do have some fairly thick traps at the front part of the room. They get very deep in the corners. I don't know, like 18 inches deep. I have two inch rigid fiberglass with an inch and a half air gap on the sides. I know that's probably okay for the reflections, not, not doing a lot for low frequencies. I've got a lot of insulation up above me in the cloud and a few things in the back. I believe the next obvious step is to do some serious bass trapping on that back wall. A different video. If we look here, you can see the calibration that is taking place. If we further open this up, we can see the before. I'm mainly concerned with the calibration and the target. One thing, when I compare my old reference in this room and I enable it, you can see that it is boosting the low frequencies more to make up for that low cut. And on here, it's not doing that so much. It's just flattening it out. And I can tell the difference. The older version has more of those sub 100 frequencies. It's the next day and I'm figuring something out. Notice that the correction is not happening below say 100 Hertz or so. If you go to this limit controls and you go from reduced to aggressive, it is uh, affecting how much of the low frequencies are corrected. There is still a spot where they're not lifting, which I, I assume, you know, if this is, I can't see it now, that's 100 hertz, well, we're getting way down there. And if I switch to my previous reference, it is making that correction below. So I'm not 100% sure why that's the case. It has something to do with this limiting control. Perhaps it's a safety feature to keep me from blowing up my speakers. You can also limit the amount of correction to 6 dB. I have more than that in some of these spots. If your calibration is not working correctly, then I assume you look at this somewhat hidden limit control section. Back to me. So in practical terms, if I'm making adjustments to the low end and the low mid and, and these high mid frequencies, then my mixes would sound more like these this green line, right? Since there's less low mid, I'm making up for it theoretically, or I am making up for the fact that I have too much of the low mids, and so my mixes would come out sounding thin. I will say this, it's not subtle. It's not subtle at all. It's a dramatic difference. You can change the filter from to zero latency if you want something more in real time. But since I'm just playing back audio, I don't mind if there's some lag. Uh, safe headroom is enabled. It's bringing the master level down 6.8 dB, which is equal to the adjustment level of these low mid frequencies. I personally have never used these custom targets, but you can increase the low end or do some EQ adjustments here. I usually keep that off. And this is a new feature that's really cool. You can listen to what a bad car sounds like or in ears. You can check to see what they sound like on A pods. Who knows what that, those are? MB Airy 13, MB Professional, uh, kind of silly there. And then there are some specific headphones, smartphones, studio speakers, uh, TV. Look, studio speakers, we have the NS11s, which is obviously going after the NS10s and the mix cubes. So small speaker, and you can see the way the curves look which I think that could be quite handy. Again, you will have to listen to for yourself, but you can try that out on the demo even if you don't have a measurement microphone. But mainly I notice you know, increased width and separation because I think it's fixing some of the phasing issues, and but most notably it's the low end. I have low end now in this room that I'm hearing in this sweet spot. I'm in Pro Tools now. This is what the plug-in version looks like. If you have older versions, there is an upgrade path and I think it's probably worth it. These new target options and custom targets uh, I think I could find those very useful. 
I haven't touched on the headphones. If you go here and add headphones, I have the Sennheiser HD 600 wired. Those are my headphones. And there I have my curve. You can see what it's doing to the low frequency and it's making some adjustments at the high end. The changes are not near as drastic as my studio speakers, but I think it makes them sound better. Should you buy this? You should at least try it. Download the demo, borrow a mic, uh, give it a go and see if it enhances your experience. The most important thing is that you know what your room sounds like and you know what your headphones sound like and you listen to a lot of material. And it can be kind of tricky if you have it sometimes and you don't have it. So if you have the software, make sure that it's always on. I lost it for a while when I was changing over computers and I was completely lost. Check it out, use my affiliate link. And if you wanna have a deeper conversation about room acoustics, I love talking about this, even though, like I said, I am an amateur, but maybe I could get somebody that could shed a little more light on the subject of acoustics in home studios. That's all I got, talk to you soon.